I've done a few Brexit videos now, and those of you who have watched them know that I support the UK leaving the EU behind. For the sake of the people in the UK, I hoped for an orderly process which re-established their national sovereignty and provided abundant opportunities. While there is a certain degree of selfishness involved in this, I really wanted these things because I thought that it would benefit the United Kingdom. I'm a bit of an Anglophile, after all. By the time that I made last week's video, however, I honestly didn't think that Brexit would become any more of a confused, leaderless mess than it already was. I thought that the leaders of the 27 other member states would tell Prime Minister May that Brexit had gone on far too long for another extension, or at least some of them would. And so I find myself making another video about Brexit in which I will attempt to understand and explain why the latest developments in Brexit have happened. I missed something very important which is why it's time again for Brexit to be the subject of some roasted opinions. The bombshell came out late on Wednesday for me. The emergency summit of leaders, during which Theresa May sat outside the room awaiting their decision, voted to grant the UK another extension to their deadline for Brexit. If the UK votes in members of the European Parliament, then they have until Halloween to sort out their issues with Brexit, agree to a deal, and have an orderly, soft Brexit. If the elections aren't held, then the UK will have to leave on the 1st of June. Naturally, President Tusk also suggested that the UK could always rescind their Article 50 letter if they vote in a new set of MEPs. Clever clog, that Tusk. He always finds a way to remind the UK public that the EU will welcome them back, no questions asked, if they only demand that the UK Parliament rescind that letter. After all, it's not the public's fault that Parliament didn't adequately prepare them for Brexit. Nor was it their fault that David Cameron unwisely asked them if they wanted to remain in the EU on that ill-advised referendum, right? No, those millions of UK voters couldn't possibly know what they wanted because they didn't know how difficult Brexit would be. Tusk is counting on this resonating with UK voters and for UK voters to pressure their parties to demand a second referendum. His message is working, too. The unrest over Brexit has been a drag break on UK economic growth in a time when the US economy has experienced significant gains. While manufacturing jobs have started to return to the US, UK manufacturing jobs have remained largely stagnant. Her Majesty's loyal opposition has continued to declare Brexit a shambles, to a demand that control over Brexit negotiations be ceded to the House of Commons at large, to demand a second referendum be held, and always, always that may concede that she hasn't a clue how to proceed and resign, which would likely provoke parliamentary elections and a possible rise of a Corbyn government. In America, we call these sort of machinations politics as usual, meaning that the politicians have little regard for what needs done for their country and their constituents. No, the acquisition of more political clout is much more important in politics as usual than addressing real issues and finding real solutions which might require real bipartisan cooperation and real compromise. I personally despise politics as usual in America, and I'm sure that most Brits find it just as annoying. It comes down to a relatively simple statement, at least for me. You were elected to do an important job on behalf of the people, to represent them and their interests. Since your election, you haven't done that job at all, and now you want for us to vote you in again because you need more time to accomplish what we elected you for and haven't even started to do? Um, no. Just, no. That's how I, as an American outsider, see the mess in the House of Commons. May's government, which rose out of the ashes after the referendum gutted Cameron's mandate, has spent more time ignoring his obligation to negotiate Brexit in good faith to worry about acquiring political power. She suggested that she would negotiate a good deal with non-EU countries like the US and China, but balked at negotiating with Donald Trump and Xi Jinping. In Trump's case, she has publicly derided him. That bodes ill for any possibility of negotiating a deal with the US in the near future, 
as President Trump is known to be a man to take umbrage at any slight. President Xi rules over a government with a history of making unbalanced trade deals in favor of China. This is the primary reason why Trump has engaged in a trade war with China to break through the block of protectionist trade practices and strike a more equitable deal for both countries. China commonly uses bilateral agreements in trade as well, which for the UK means that anything negotiated with the Americans will not necessarily become China's default position with the British. The EU, meanwhile, has leveraged their considerable collective power to expand their influence in developing countries and their economies. Those countries are less likely to agree a better deal with the UK if it risks their gains in the larger EU markets. Theresa May could have, and likely should have, sent trade delegations all over the world to negotiate contingent trade deals to take effect the moment the UK was no longer bound by EU trade deals. If she has, though, I just haven't seen it. As for the exit deal with the EU, many people pointed out that the UK was in a stronger position than the one from which they seemed to have negotiated. May's government has forgotten that the UK represents 15% of the EU economy. That the trade balance between other EU member states and the UK was in favor of those other states, and that the goods which the UK needs to purchase from outside sources can come from other sources than those in the EU. Say, for instance, the US and China, which would be happy to gain more market access in the UK for their trade goods in exchange for more access to trade goods from the UK. The weak point in all of this is the service based nature of UK economy, of course. While manufacturing in the UK has stalled for decades, the primary exports of Mary Old have continued to be services, and the primary markets for those services have been in the EU. The US has a strong services component to its own economy, and the services the UK offers are of much less use in China, which jealously guards its own domestic interests in this sector. The solution would be to develop more manufacturing, but that would represent a significant reversal of emphasis in UK economic expansion. That's the weakness which has economists in London predicting the dire effects for the British economy after Brexit. It will take years to realign the British economy to boost manufacturing and resource production. Manufacturing development will require markets for those finished goods. Resource production is necessarily limited by the significant portion of access to those resources currently allocated by the EU to other member nations. France in particular has grown very quarrelsome about access to British fisheries, which after a hard Brexit would have to be renegotiated with the UK lest the French fishing industry collapse from too many fishermen and not enough waters to fish. And France isn't the only nation which fishes that quota assigned from the UK. Will the UK face hard times? Probably to some extent. Is Parliament concerned? Certainly. Has May and her government mitigated the potential disaster looming after Brexit? Not really. So is Jeremy Corbyn, the leader of the opposition, poised to correct it? No, he isn't. And that's the real problem. Corbyn is a socialist whose approach to every issue comes from an ivory tower. He is less interested in real solutions to problems than the eventual victory of his ideology and the aggregation of political power in the hands of the Labour Party. The opposition is expected to challenge the government on matters of policy, but they are also expected to come up with effective countervailing proposals to present in debate when the government has taken a misstep. Corbyn's proposals, however, are at odds with his positions during the Brexit referendum and make him look absurd. We need to vote leave has given way to we need to vote again. He has spoken out repeatedly, saying anything to jog the government's collective elbow as they attempt to undo decades of economic entanglement, just so long as it weakens the Tories and their hold on government. The Scottish National Party has opposed everything to do with the UK government all along the way. As a regional party, they were never going to take power in Parliament. However, they effectively control the devolved government in Scotland and want Scotland out of the UK. If the government was protecting Remain, then Ian Blackford would have wagged his finger and shouted, That's not good enough! at Theresa May, intimating that Scotland would leave the UK because they wanted out of the EU. 
Since the government is protecting leave, however, he weekly reminds Commons during PMQs that May's attempts to manage Brexit are shambolic and demands that Scotland be granted another referendum on remaining in the UK. Never mind that Scotland is one of the two monarchies united in 1706, nor that Her Majesty is Queen of England and Scotland both by right of birth. The Democrat Unionist Party is the counterbalance to the opposition which guarantees that the Tories can remain in government. They are another regional party, this time from Northern Ireland, and their great issue is that the Good Friday Accords be maintained. This is a critical issue to them, as is their sovereignty as members of the UK. Their neighbor to the south is a member state in the EU in their own right, which complicates matters quite a bit there. Not to mention that Sinn Féin, an Irish political party found in both countries, believes that the reunification of Ireland as a nation independent of the UK is inevitable. Therefore, anything which concedes power to the EU concedes power indirectly to the Republic of Ireland, making several issues associated with Brexit also issues which affect the border between Ireland and Northern Ireland, and therefore issues of the Good Friday Accords. This has raised a general lack of support within the DUP for the deal which May brought back from Brussels, further weakening her position in Commons and especially on Brexit. The Liberal Democrats seem to be raising decent points, in my humble opinion. Yes, they are still in opposition, and yes, they still oppose Brexit. But from what I've gathered, their positions have been consistent. Honestly held dissent without changeability is an honorable part of the political process. The Lib Dems have supported European integration for as far back as I can determine, yet their opposition to Brexit has underpinned a more transitory nature of the positions of Labour and the SNP. It is unfortunate, in my opinion, to sully legitimately held opposition with political machination, and all too common. So what happens now that an extension has been granted? Theresa May possibly has a new lease on life in 10 Downing Street, if she can mediate between the deal Parliament wants and the deal the Executive Council wants and find a good compromise. Alternately, with the extension seen as betrayal of Brexit, the hard Brexiteers may raise enough opposition to oust her. The extension certainly isn't popular, as what was given was much longer than many members of Parliament wanted her to get from the EU. Perhaps new elections could be triggered as well, which would likely see the return of UKIP to Parliament and even complete the rise of a Corbyn government. For my part, I believe that Corbyn in any position of authority is as grave a mistake as allowing May to continue dithering and stalling her way through the extraordinary mess that is Brexit. The Tories and Labour both need new leadership. I believe that May is on her way out, and soon, but Labour won't make any changes without a change in the balance of power in Commons. Ideally, that would mean the resurgence of the Lib Dems as the principal opposition party. Rationally, though, it would mean a Labour government just like the ones which swept Cameron into power through their own sheer incompetence. Now imagine that. Jeremy Corbyn exiting the front door of 10 Downing Street as Prime Minister to speak with the press. God save the United Kingdom.